Welcome to worship on this second Sunday in Easter. This service is brought to you by Chorley and Leyland Methodists. We hope they had a good Easter and managed to celebrate Christ's resurrection in a meaningful way. Whilst the supermarkets are discounting their chocolate Easter eggs and preparing the way for the next retail extravaganza, I guess that's the coronation, the church uses this Eastertide period up to Pentecost to reflect upon our faith and the new life Christ brings. Let's use a centuries old piece of music to prepare ourselves for meeting God and hearing his word for us today. May you know his blessing through what is shared. Let us pray. Blessing and praise be to you, Lord our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By your great mercy, you have given us new life and new hope through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. You have brought us into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading and in heaven. To you be praise through Christ our risen Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Here's something that will make you sit up and pay attention. Information is coming to light that Jesus travelled to Lancashire and made a significant impact upon the lives of many locals. Scripture tells us that as a lad, Jesus had a bit of a wanderlust and he scared his parents silly when he disappeared on a trip to Jerusalem. The desire to travel and explore never left him. So he took a gap year after finishing at Carpentry College and prior to starting on his ministry. He joined a small band of Roman soldiers whose job was to undertake a reconnaissance of Britain prior to Claudius's full-scale invasion in AD 43. They travelled much further north than Caesar's army of 54 BC had done. And Jesus parted company with the militia when he encountered the beautiful northwest. The people of Bamber Bridge gave Jesus a very warm welcome and an enduring friendship was formed. So much so that centuries later, they named their church after him, St. Saviour's. 
It's also believed that after Jesus' resurrection and in an event which mirrored the encounter with the Galilean fishermen for breakfast on the shore, Jesus had a reunion with his Lancashire followers at the Leyland Cross Fish and Chip Restaurant, an eatery renowned as one of the best in the area. What do you think? I was practising my creative writing skills and preparing a script for submission to the BBC 4's programme The Unbelievable Truth. For those of you who don't know, the panel game hosted by David Mitchell uh, is where contestants try to hide truths in a narrative of untruths and lies. I don't think I'll be submitting it after all, but you can let me know sometime which of my facts were true. David, Mi David Mitchell is also known as a contestant on the hugely popular TV programme Would I Lie to You? Clearly, there is humour in trying to separate the truth from lies. Well, on TV and radio shows, perhaps. In life, the discernment of truth is far more serious. Is a particular media report true? Is the sales literature correct? Is the job reference telling the truth? We live in an age of fake news and intentional lies, which sadly is often perpetrated by leaders and others, some in positions of huge responsibility and spread intentionally or otherwise through social media. When it comes to our faith, discerning the truth is sorting out what we build our lives upon, how we relate to God and to others. It is no less important than that. The question that we sing with gusto, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green, is tantalising to some. But far more fundamental questions are important to sincere believers. What do we believe is a crucial question to answer. But alongside it is another. Who do we believe? We're going to be looking at these questions in a little while. But right now, let's worship God and remind ourselves of some of the essentials of our Christian faith. Let's sing, crown him with many crowns. Now we 
Before we move on, let's acknowledge a very old fake news story, one that we find at the end of Matthew's Gospel. At the instigation of the Jewish religious leaders, a story is fabricated and given to the soldiers who had been tasked with guarding Jesus' tomb. The story went like this. The disappearance of Jesus' body was all down to it being stolen by the disciples while they, the guards, were asleep. This was all to prove that there was no resurrection. The soldiers were paid off and the religious leaders would back up the fake news story if they were ever approached. At the time of writing the gospel, this story was clearly still doing the rounds. We thank God for the corrective accounts that were proclaimed by those who encountered the living Christ. It's not always easy to discern the truth. What do we believe? In giving our answers, we will no doubt start by saying that which is contained in the Gospels. After all, we are familiar with the phrase gospel truth. But it isn't always straightforward. Some of us will understandably struggle at this time of Easter because we have different accounts of Jesus' last week and variant accounts of the resurrection. I can remember my New Testament tutor starting her course on the Synoptic Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark and Luke, by comparing what we have, the sometimes divergent stories contained in the Gospels, with witness statements after a road accident. After a car crash, there will be many people involved in piecing together what took place. For example, the drivers uh, and perhaps a host of onlookers. And they may well all have their take on what actually happened. Vested interest, inability to accurately remember details and bias they all colour their accounts. The police and insurance underwriters have quite a job to discern the truth, just like we have a challenge to make sense of divergent resurrection stories, for example. In essence, and in both the crash scenario and the resurrection event, one single event took place, but there may be a multitude of perspectives. The three letters VAR, standing for Video Assisted Referee, are now associated with a game of football. An event happens, for example, a foul or a disputed goal, and numerous different opinions are expressed, sometimes with a great deal of passion. This is because people see the action from different angles, or their view is only partial. Video recordings have become useful tools used by the ref to discern the truth. The hope is that the images caught provide clarity because of their trustworthiness and non-bias. To come to a deeper understanding of our faith and its fundamental truths, we need spiritual discernment. But alongside that, an acknowledgement of trusted sources that have been recognised and accepted by God's people over a long period of time. But it has never been easy distilling the essentials. The early church struggled at least as much as the contemporary one. 
I remember a book on my shelves from college days entitled Creeds, Councils and Controversies. It said it all. In the first four or five centuries, the Christian church sought divine truth that it could proclaim while dismissing heresies and all kinds of wacky ideas. It was often a hard struggle. Following on from intense argument and round the table conferences, statements of faith were written that have served the church well over the intervening centuries. The best known are the Nicene Creed and the slightly shorter Apostles' Creed. Perhaps some of us grew up learning these by rote. I suspect that they are not used in collective worship as much as they used to be. Today, I have included the Apostles' Creed in today's online worship and invite you to join in as an affirmation of your faith. Unlike the Nicene Creed, with its collective, we believe, the Apostles' Creed allows for a personal statement of faith. Let's hear, and perhaps join in with, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Whilst we could all, I believe, have a firmer grasp on faith essentials, much will always remain beyond us, a mystery. In singing our next hymn, we acknowledge this fact, but then reaffirm those essentials of which we are confident. The hymn is, I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon us now or then.
Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were awestruck. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood amongst them and said, peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. Jesus said, So you believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. Thanks be to God for his word. I said we look at the question, who do we believe? But before that, let's acknowledge that our primary trusted source of information regarding our Christian faith is always going to be scripture. At the end of our gospel passage that we've just heard, John states the purpose of his writing. It was so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. We thank John and the other gospel writers for putting the story of Jesus's life and death down for us in writing. But as we all know, from our earliest days, we are informed and taught by many not least family, but also friends and other trusted ones in school and in church. Instruction and learning in its widest sense is a key part of early upbringing. And we need to put these two things, that is the central place of scripture and the testimony of trusted folk together to properly answer the question, who do we believe? For we must turn to those who know and trust who also have a love and respect for God's word in scripture. We will know who they are by the way they engage with the Bible, read it and study it, and are not afraid to wrestle with the difficult bits. Many of us will value the input of such people in our lives, and we need to be thankful for them. They will also need to be people who live their lives with an integrity founded on their faith. I'm reminded of the series we did prior to Lent, looking at the wisdom for living found in the book of Proverbs. There will also be those who take a cautious view to all the new resources available, not dismissing them out of hand, but weighing them up against their experience and the collective insight of the wider fellowship of believers. If 
I make it sound straightforward and easy, then forgive me, because it's not. And at this point, we turn to the disciple Thomas, the one at the centre of our Gospel reading. Thomas, of course, is remembered primarily as the doubter. He failed to respond positively to the excitement that the other disciples experienced upon seeing Jesus back with them, back from the dead. He said there was no way he could believe on the say-so of others. They, the disciples, trusted friends and colleagues, didn't manage to convince Thomas of the truth. Thomas also failed to appreciate what Jesus had taught them as his followers about coming back from the grave. Thomas's faith foundations were shaky too. Might it also have been that during this period of absence from the fellowship, Thomas had encountered some folk who'd shared with him that fake news story being broadcast by the soldiers that his so-called friends had in some way been complicit in the disappearance of Jesus' body. But for Thomas, things then changed. Jesus came amongst them and invited Thomas to touch and feel his not yet healed body, which was all that Thomas needed. His declaration of faith is profound, despite its brevity. Lucky Thomas, we might say. And Jesus told him he was one of a privileged few to physically encounter his risen self. Knowing the facts of God's plan for us, first and foremost through the life and death of Jesus, the gospel essentials, is the key foundation for our faith. The Bible may be helpfully supplemented by creeds and catechisms. In addition, having the living testimony, example and encouragement of others is going to help us come to faith and grow in faith. That's a big part of what the church is for. But a living faith is dependent upon a meaningful encounter with Christ. That wouldn't be exactly like Thomas's, but it may be like the Apostle Paul's encounter on the road to Damascus, which he suggested was on a par with the first post-resurrection appearances. Gordon shared with us last week of his encounter with Christ. Many others have similar stories to tell. Hopefully, I've begun to answer the what and who questions that I posed earlier. But I end by reiterating that these are difficult matters, increasingly difficult in contemporary times, I suspect. But I also remind you that in that locked room in Jerusalem, amongst the excited and yet confused disciples, Jesus imparted his Holy Spirit, whose task was to bring help in daily living particularly in determining the truth, in discerning what it is that is essential to our faith. As we move towards Pentecost, we need to ask God to impart his spirit amongst us. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks for all who, though they have not seen you, have believed. We give thanks for the disciples and your appearing to them in the upper room. Help us to know that you are with us in your risen power. We pray for Christians who are fearful of persecution, for all who are suffering because of their faith. May your church speak out boldly in the power of your resurrection. Christ, risen Lord, be with us and give us your peace. We pray for all who are seekers after justice, freedom and peace. Bless the work of the United Nations and all peacekeeping forces. Protect all 
who seek to bring new life and peace to troubled communities. We pray for community workers and all councils, as well as our national government. Christ, risen Lord, be with us and give us your peace. We give thanks for those who have taught us the faith, who shared their beliefs with us. We are grateful for all who have set us examples to follow. May we rejoice in your presence in our homes and our families. May we show forth your power in our lives. Bless us in all our dealings and relationships. Christ, risen Lord, be with us and give us your peace. We pray for all who are locked in by guilt or fear. All who are afraid to venture because of risk and danger. We pray for all who need healing of past hurts, for the healing of memories. For all who are suffering from losing loved ones through accidents, crime or illness. Christ, risen Lord, be with us and give us your peace. We give thanks for all who have passed beyond death and rejoice in your kingdom. For all who have triumphed over sin and suffering and are now at peace. Christ, risen Lord, be with us and give us your peace. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. The 
Thank you for joining with us today and we'd love to share with you again next weekend if you'd like to be in touch with us our details are shown at the end of this video remember of course that we are a collection of Methodist churches in the Chorley and Leyland area who meet in the flesh as it were and any time you wanted to join us for worship on a Sunday morning you'd be more than welcome Details of times and places are on our circuit website. Let me close by sharing the peace and a blessing. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The peace of of the Lord be always with you. And now fix your gaze on the glory of the risen Christ and be transformed him from glory to glory. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>